Welcome back to my Inner Sanctum radio shop this morning. Looking at the Coronado 686, 1936 AM and two-band shortwave radio chassis, this was brought into my shop a few days ago by a customer who I just met who is an expert on ham radio and uh, ham equipment, so he's going to teach me something about ham radio, and I'm going to endeavor to teach him something about restoring vintage electronics. Looking at the controls left to right, the volume control, tone control, dial control, and band select. Tuning is very precise, done with wheel and pinion. Uh, looking at the top of the chassis, now we're looking at the tubes consisting of the 6C5 oscillator, 6L7 antenna or RF gain stage, 6K7IF, the 6Q7, which is two tubes in one envelope, the detector and audio amplifier, also the 6F6 output tube and the 5Y3 rectifier. Oscillator and antenna coils, front right and rear right respectively, the variable condenser and the two marina tower-like looking structures, on the left-hand side are the old, ver uh, old filter condensers. You can also see the IF condensers, center, rear, and uh, left front. My uh, usual lady camera operator left me in a lurch and went to church this morning, leaving me to uh, flip the radios and uh, do the uh, video myself, but she promised to say a couple of prayers for me, so... Uh, I feel like I'm in good hands this morning. I hope this chassis is in good hands and doesn't roll off the bench. Yeah, I think i got pretty good footing here. So now we'll endeavor to explore the underside of the Coronado 686. My customer did a very good job of wiring in the um, new capacitors that you can see, the little yellow jobs there. He replaced the old waxy condensers, which cause uh, nothing but problems. Those are the old bypass and coupling condensers. He also removed the tuner and replaced the tuner grommets. Tuner grommets have a tendency to wear and get hard. The tuner will wobble around and cause all sorts of trouble. Soldering is very good, very tight. Um, pointing out a few of the capacitors around the area that he put in. I think there's like seven or eight in all. Moving on over to the filter condensers. Uh, that is kind of where the problem began that he had with his radio. Many times the technician, and I've done it a number of times with my radios, will remove the old wadding that's inside the original filters and stuff up inside the replacements and then bring the wires down underneath. Makes for a very neat job. That's the power transformer. And uh, then we're going to be moving over to the candome resistor, which provides the bias for the control grids for the various tubes. Getting closer to the problem that he had with his radio. He was the victim of a diagram that he found online that was incorrect that actually showed the bias resistor, which is right there. Uh, the uh, one end of the bias resistor is supposed to go to B minus. The diagram showed it going to B plus. B minus will make the control grid negative on the AF tube, which is what it's supposed to be. Uh, the way it was wired in, there was 120 volts going to the control grid, so normally, naturally, the radio wasn't working. Uh, it was a fairly easy problem to discover, and it really wasn't his fault. Like I said, he was just the victim of some bad information. That's the wave trap coil. Again, we're seeing the antenna coils, and then moving on up ahead, we're seeing the bottom of the oscillator coils as well. A little bit of a glimpse of the band switch. The mica condensers... I should say never need replacing, but most rarely they don't. I've probably replaced 10 in the last 40 years. They're very accurate, and they hold their value, unlike the waxy capacitors. That's about uh, all we're going to be looking at underneath right now. It's about all there is to see. So again, I'm playing the part of the one-arm chassis turner and pulling out the, both the ground and the antenna wires. We're on level ground, and we're going to kind of drift around to the front here and close out our presentation. As you can see, there is, again is the gearing for the variable condenser. Somebody castigated me one time on radio forum. I referred to it as tuner, and he said, no, it is a variable condenser. That's the connection for the uh, field coil and the input to the audio transformer. Both elements are housed on the speaker. Uh, before we move on with the alignment of the 686 Coronado chassis, I thought we would take a look at a diagram that is pertinent to our discussion today. In fact, we're going to take a look at a couple of diagrams, the erroneous one and the correct one. 
This was the bad one. This is the one that my customer followed, caused him to have a non-working radio and a blown tube. If we take a look at the audio section specifically of the 6Q7 cathode control grid and plate and the biasing resistor R9 3 megohm, we can see that it connects directly with the positive side of C16, which is one of two 8 microfarad electrolytic capacitors. That junction places about 120 volts on the control grid of the tube, driving the tube to saturation and ruining the tube. This is a look at the correct diagram. This is in Rider, volume 7, page 65. This radio is listed under Gamble's. Gamble Scogmo of Minneapolis sold Coronado radios. The chassis was built by Belmont Radio of New York. And taking a look at the 6Q7 circuit, we see something entirely different. This is correct. Look at the bias resistor R9. It junctions directly with the two biasing resistors R12 and R13. Those two together with R14 make up the candome resistor assembly, that little silver strip that we saw underneath the chassis. The bias at the junction is minus 4.8 volts DC, and I believe when I measured the control grid voltage after I made the correction, I was reading about 2.8 volts, which is normal. Actually, the negative side of C16, 8 microfarad electrolytic, is in parallel to the biasing circuit, R9, and the biased junction of R12 and R13. And with that, let's move on and have some fun aligning the IF of our Coronado 686. Well, while your back was turned, I snuck off and had a coffee break. But in the meantime, I uh, let the equipment warm up, including the radio and the test equipment, for about a half an hour, which is a common practice, something you're supposed to do. And we are just about ready to begin our alignment. Looking at the connection, this is the first connection that I made from the output of the speaker transformer. And we'll gradually drift. My camera lady is not here. She's probably either at church or some smorgasbord someplace. So I'm doing this all by myself. And we are over here at the Hewlett Packard 400L meter that I use for my alignments. There are three ways to do alignments either by ear, which you shouldn't do, a meter, or an oscilloscope. I use an oscilloscope for a lot of FM work. I also use a Sencor frequency counter to set my frequency. We are using the IF frequency of 465 KC. I love Sencor, Hewlett Packard, and uh, Hickok. You can see a Sencor there. Uh, Simpson, VOM, and... Uh, this is my B&K signal generator. I'd be lost without it. Pretty well-equipped test bench. I bought this one about seven years ago, and it was calibrated at the time. I don't do uh, work for the government. I don't do rocket science here, so I don't send my equipment in annually at $250 per piece to have it calibrated. And some of it hasn't been calibrated in 15 years and works quite well. I'm turning my volume control full crank, according to the manual. It doesn't say to do this, but a common practice is with a tone control, you turn that completely sharp. I'm going to check my meter setting right now, and uh, my meter is at about one-half scale. I generally like to start at about one-third scale, but we'll start there and see where we go. And uh, I'll probably have to increase as we go up because the tone will get louder the closer we get to the eye of frequency. I have everything set up here. I have my signal, that's the dummy antenna by the way. The output of the signal generator is on the grid cap of the 6K7. The other end of the gener generator by the way is connected to ground. You're looking at the second IF, that is where we start. The variable adjustment screw, it could be the input or the output, I don't know which. Some manuals specify you start with one or the other. 
I will start with the adjustment screw that is closest to me because I want to. And as I adjust the variable, we are going upscale. I'm looking for a peak. And it looks as though maybe I have found it. And if so, I will move over to the second variable adjustment and also search for a peak. And that one was actually fairly close, which is kind of amazing. Come on, settle down there. Uh, okay, looks pretty good. Just hold it there for a second. Looks good. This is a lot of fun. I like doing this kind of thing. Uh, making videos and working on old radios kind of goes together. Had a pretty good career in, r in radio broadcasting as well. Okay, now it is time to take a look at the first IF. So I'll remove my clip lead and go over to the 6L7, the input to the radio, the RF gain, and proceed to adjust the first IF. That black wire you see is the ground. It's kind of being a little pesky. It's not touching anything. It's just kind of in the way. And I'm moving my dummy antenna around. I want to make sure that uh, it isn't touching anywhere. If my dummy is touching ground, I'm a dummy, and I shouldn't be doing this kind of work. Okay, we're all connected up, and we're about ready to peak the first IF. And I'm on the first variable, the one closest to me. And uh, there I am, right there. Okay. And I'm going to be looking for a peak, just as I did with the second IF. And it appears it was off some. This normally happens with old radios when they're recapped, and even when they haven't been recapped, the uh, uh, transformers drift a little bit. We're looking for good selectivity and sensitivity, and of course, increased volume as we get closer to our IF. And when I peak the first uh, variable, I will go to the second and check that as well. The manual also says to keep the clip lead from the test oscillator on the grid cap of the 6L7 and recheck the second IF, which I'm doing right now. And it, it was off a little bit, uh, but not appreciably. But it's always good to follow the manual and not take shortcuts as I have in the past, because then I wind up spending hours uh, correcting what I already did. That pretty well completes our alignment and our tutorial for today of the Coronado 686. Thanks a lot. Have a good